How's everybody doing? Y'all hanging in there? Life. Life comes at you, right? Well, I um, am glad to be a part of your day. And especially if I can encourage you. And selfishly, I love this time too because I always get encouraged um, just by focusing in on who God is for us and we are expanding our perspective of who he is the knowledge of God can't possibly flood the earth if it doesn't flood our own hearts and our own perspectives so we're growing in the knowledge of the glory of God how he is who he is his goodness um, so thanks for jumping on here we are talking about God as king on the mountain of government, and I'm going to switch back again today into this book, Rainbow God, The Seven Colors of Love, and I will remind you again that we wrote this whole book, and especially this chapter, before we had the understanding that we currently have of how serious things are in government. And uh, so we might have written it differently, but it's uh, the, the, the heart of it is still the same. So I'm going to begin here. If you have the book, I'm on page 112, and it's a section called, Who is God as King? It's hard to trust a God. Uh, this is me speaking. It's hard to trust a God that allows suffering and pain. If he wants us to trust him, then why allow innocent ones to suffer? Remember the answer to these questions rests in the hands of a king whose kingdom has not fully come, but will. It already exists in heaven, that realm that is more real than what we have here. We are receiving an unshakable kingdom, meaning it can't ever fall to corruption. Isn't that incredible? The kingdom that we are receiving, that we will one, one day live in eternity in, will never be able to fall to corruption. The more you experience corruption here on this side, I think the more you begin to understand the risk that God was willing to take to allow all that he's allowed in the context of free will freedom, our inheritance before we were ready for it as humanity, he allowed all of that so that one day the possibility of what we call corruption or tyranny or all of these things could never, ever happen again. I mean, when you see just how bad it is, you realize like, we, we needed to go through this process as humans, as humanity, as a society, as a people that God called to himself, as his creation, as sons and daughters. We needed to go through a, a refiner's fire so that corruption and all that we think of when we think of evil in the earth could never happen again. So we're a part of, of um, you know, that process. Oh, I might have just lost you guys over here. Back. Okay. Um, so, all right, jumping back in here. The, the, this king, so we're receiving an unshakable kingdom, meaning it can't ever fall to corruption. And uh, let's see. That scripture that goes with that, sometimes I forget to give you scripture references. That is Hebrews 12, 28. This king is never the source of corruption or evil and the suffering that comes from it. Although this king is compassionate, he is not moved by pain because, unlike us, he knows the temporary state of it as compared to the eternal state of intimacy that we are being prepared for with him. You know, that can be a hard thing to like wrap our hearts around. He's not moved by pain. He is compassionate. 
he has compassion on all pain in its varying ways of unfolding in our lives. He has tremendous compassion. We saw that in the way that Jesus lived. But we also know that pain didn't stop him from doing what needed to be done for all of eternity. And so, you know, Jesus is the most precious thing, the firstborn of God. He is part of the Godhead. The Father is absolutely loves the Son. He loves us too, but we know, we know, we know how much he loves the Son, Jesus. And yet he allowed his pain and suffering. So anyway, uh, he uses the very weapon Satan meant for our destruction to produce in us the opportunity to know him in ways we wouldn't if we didn't need to. You can't know him, for example, as comforter when you haven't mourned. You can't know him as provider when you haven't experienced lack. You can't know him as king when you are content with man's version of leadership. You can't know him as king when you are content with man's version of leadership. This king is for us and never against us. Even when we reject him, he pursues us until our last breath. He wants to teach us how to serve like he does. So we establish government on earth that is true to his heart for us. He wants us to grow in the knowledge of how he serves. So we can serve like he does and remove corruption and evil from those who are suffering under the lies of the enemy. He even wants to deliver those leaders who have become so deceived themselves that they are being used as pawns by Satan. Many are fighting against God and they think they're fighting for him. God is the king of kings and we are kings under the king. We will learn to rule like he does, so his kingdom, his better ways of doing everything, can be established in the earth. All right, we're switching to Johnny speaking here. Heaven runs as a perfect kingdom and not as a republic or democracy. Okay, that's pretty interesting to look at. Kingdom concepts are easier to grasp when you live in a kingdom. A case can be made that government has the power to institute, override, and rule over all other sectors of society. And that is true. Government is ultimately where power is officially consolidated. Especially in a kingdom context, all the power sits at the top. Here on earth, we've established alternative government structures designed to provide checks and balances for too much centralized power. But of course, in heaven, there is no such concern. The Bible says of God that righteousness and justice are the foundations of his throne. That's Psalm 89, 14. <coughs> Excuse me. This means everything is done from the king's heart of pure integrity and pure fairness. You don't need checks and balances of power based on that kind of foundation. God the King doesn't have to try to be just. He is by his very nature. He doesn't have to continually remind himself of Stephen Covey's, Covey's uh, Seven Habits of Effective People. He contains in his nature the perfected versions of whatever experts admire as good character. God is completely perfect in governmental character governmental strategy, and governmental execution. You would think that we humans might want to invite in such a wise and accomplished ruler. But here again, we find ourselves reverting to our orphan spirit that acts like we just have to figure out everything on our own. To know, um, this is, we'll finish with me here, to know the real God as king we must continue to look at how Jesus lived. Jesus taught us that in order to be a true leader, we would need to be a great servant. 
He modeled his authority as king by laying his life down. He taught us to obey our father by being obedient himself. Jesus showed us that someone with real authority is submitted to authority too. The God of the universe came to earth through Jesus and embraced humility, all for the sake of restoring to us the possibility of intimacy with himself. Just as Jesus lived under the authority of the Father while he lived here, he also wants us to experience living under authority that has our best interest always in mind, so we too could learn to lead with servant hearts that prioritize the best for those we're leading. We too will be kings when we live as those who have laid down their own rights for him and for one another. When we learn to lead like God the King, his kingdom will be among us in its fullness. When we learn to lead like God the King, his kingdom will be among us in its fullness. A kingdom is the domain or sphere of authority of a king. It is essentially that king's ways of ruling or doing things, his system of governing. This king's ways are always better than our ways because he sees and knows what we cannot see and know. His plans for us are always better motivated than ours. Seeing God as king in our nations begins with encountering him as king in our own hearts and lives individually. All right. Um, I want to just quickly go verbally. I'm not going to go scripture by scripture um, just for the sake of time, but I just want to kind of go verbally through I don't even know that I have a main point to make with this. It's just interesting to think about. So it's something I want to leave with you. You know, Jesus, at the end of his um, life, before he uh, allowed himself to be sacrificed on the cross, he was uh, part the, the main accusation that was made against him was that he was king of the Jews. And he went through this um, you know, the, the final day uh, leading up to his crucifixion, he was confronted by um, Pilate, and then Pilate took him before all of the people, and there was this conversation um, through his very unfair sentencing was, are you, they're saying that you're claiming to be king of the Jews, are you? And Jesus simply answered, it is as you say. And so he didn't deny being king of the Jews, which is very profound because here you have the Jews that are standing before Pilate. And Pilate is a Roman. He is, he represents the, the governmental authority of that time. And then you have the Jews with their leaders who represented the spiritual authority of that time. And um, of course, we know that it ends with Jesus on the cross with a sign above him that they made for him to mock him, saying, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And here, you know, the a king for them, for like us here in the United States, that'd be like a president or even more so. Like the, the king was, was never disgraced, always honored. And so here this picture of him hanging um, without clothes, beaten, dying on a cross, looking, you know, vulnerable is an understatement. And this title that was there mocking him. And then I want to just go back all the way to the beginning of his life. Of course, there's all kinds of um, prophetic, in the Old Testament, prophetic pictures and words of Jesus coming, the Messiah coming as king. And David in the Psalms, um, many of his prophetic Psalms, he speaks into that. And 
him as a king, recognizing the kingship of, of God the Father and the Messiah that was to come. But here, at Jesus' birth, the wise men, who are often referred to as kings, um, the wise men came from afar and they um, said, we have come to worship the king. They were the first to acknowledge him as king. And we know that the king, the true natural king at the time, King Herod, um, was so freaked out by this possibility that there would arise a king among the Jews who they were constantly, um, you know, putting down. They were like the, the working class of, of the Romans. And so they were there more so. They were like slaves almost. And here they are, they're, they're living among the Romans who had conquered this area, um, but they were afraid that they would rise up if they had a king. And so King Herod, and obviously there was more, um, Satan was pushing King Herod's buttons because he was a very broken, deceived man. And so he has literally an entire generation of baby boys among the Jews killed off because he didn't want someone that, that had been potentially prophesied or thought of as king to arise. So this idea of, of Jesus being the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords was um, heavy on Lucifer's mind. And we have to remember that Lucifer had already seen in heaven Jesus. He had already seen him in his full authority. And Lucifer saw this vulnerable place in the Father who had sent Jesus, his son, to earth. And he saw um, an opportunity to come after the one that he loathes, which is the Father, and come after him by coming after the object of his affection, which was Jesus, who was the king, and to, to mock and to prevent him from being seen as the true king here on earth to all of his sons and daughters. Um, and especially to his firstborn, Israel. He didn't want Jesus' true identity, identity to be seen. And so um, we also see this, this picture of Jesus as king. I'm sorry, I hope you are not being distracted by the noise. Maybe this microphone is keeping you from hearing it. But right outside my window, they're working on something construction-wise, and it's super loud. Um, but... Um, we see also in this very interesting moment that I had forgotten about, but everyone remembers Jesus feeding the 5,000 with the disciples, and he's gathered the 5,000. There's all these people. It's really a whole lot more people than that, and they're all there, and they've been listening to Jesus speak, and they're in awe of the wisdom and the prophetic anointing that is coming out of this man who was so common and was like them but yet utterly different and they have they get to this place where they've been there so long that they're so hungry and Jesus works this miracle where, where he includes his disciples the king of kings he's teaching them how to lead by serving and he takes the least of these, this little boy in, out of the crowd who has a little bit of food, the, the infamous um, five loaves and two fishes. And he takes it and he tells, you know, without going blow by blow, they multiply it. There's enough food overflowing for everyone. There's even 12 baskets left over when they're done. And um, here we have this little verse right at the end of this section on the feeding of the 5,000. And it says, And Jesus perceived that the crowd was going to force him to become king 
So he quickly departed from them and went alone to the mountain. Wow. So here they are. There, there's this climate governmentally um, that they're all so eager. This has been prophesied for generations that a king would come, a messiah would come among them. But their thinking was so narrow that all they could think of was him ruling and reigning right then and there for their generation as king in the flesh, not understanding the bigger picture of what God was actually sending Jesus for. King for all of eternity and king of kings, those who would rule and reign with him. Um, and then, of course, there's this moment that we always celebrate um, around Easter time, which is the king, Jesus, coming in on a donkey, riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. And people were literally hailing him and honoring him as king. He had worked so many miracles. He had spoken so much truth. He had stood up in the face of um, the religion that had just ugh, just come heavy on top of them and the, the legalism. And, and then they'd also experienced all this tyranny from the, the Roman government that was so oppressive to them. And here is Jesus. And so they genuinely were honoring him as king. And they were Jews who had come to believe in him and the Messiah. And this king chooses intentionally a donkey to ride in on. It's amazing. So he's demonstrating for us the humility that he has as king. He's demonstrating for us the heart of our father. I mean, literally, he could have come riding in on anything, on anything that we could dream up. Wow, you know, he chose a hee-haw donkey. <laughs> that, that was like the, the symbol for them of, of work. Work, like the donkey carried things for them. It's amazing just when you really let that settle in. Especially when you see the bigger picture of Jesus, the, Jesus as king representing the authority of God himself, of all of heaven. All power is in this idea of this reality of Jesus as king. God as king. And, you know, I think it was Pilate that, you know, then fast forward again to his crucifixion and his, his sentencing. He says, Pilate says to the Jews, Behold your king. Behold your king. And then he asks them, Do you do you want he he's trying to take the blame off of himself and say, Who do you choose? This man that's been convicted of of um, I don't remember what the guy was convicted of, this this convict, or or your king. And they said, we will let the convict go free, crucify this one. It's, just, it's, it's something to process. But here we are. Here's the, the most exciting part of all. Um, now we have the lawn being mowed right outside my window. <laughs> anyway, um, okay. Revelation 19.16. I want to read to you. I'm going to read through um, the Passion Translation. I'm going to start at verse 11. Just read a few verses here, five verses. The bridegroom king, the bridegroom king on the white horse. Of course, this is John speaking. He was having this encounter. He was caught up into heaven. Then I saw heaven opened, and suddenly a white horse appeared. The name of the one riding it was faithful and true. 
and with pure righteousness he judges and rides to battle. He wore many regal crowns, and his eyes were flashing like flames of fire. He had a secret name inscribed on him that's known only to himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his title is called the Word of God. Following him on white horses were the armies of heaven, wearing white fine linen, pure and bright. A sharp sword came from his mouth with which to conquer the nations, and he will shepherd them with an iron scepter. He will trample out the wine in the winepress of the wrath of God. On his robe and on his thigh he had inscribed a name, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Wow. Right? Wow. So it began with King of Kings. What was attacked, the accusation was he's claiming to be king, to have authority and power. He demonstrated the authority and power of heaven and he died with the correct title as mocking. It's, just, it's all just something to think about in the context of where the enemy is coming in so strongly right now in the world. This battle that we are in over the authority of our, over our nations and government that, that is not done his way, but that we are called to influence and to, to bring God's better way of governing to, to turn this around and fill our governments with servant leaders who truly love and care about people. If the lie that's perpetuated about God in this area of culture is that he doesn't care, it means people that don't care about us are standing in his seat of authority. And so we're given opportunity as the kingdom of God manifests in the earth to partner with God by showing up in these areas of culture and specifically in government as proof that God does care, meaning we actually have to care. If we're called to government in any capacity, if, if, if your, um, your pay, what you take home, your salary is the word I'm looking for, if your salary comes from the government, then you are working on the government mountain. And if you're working on the government mountain, then the, the, the simplicity of what that means is that you are called to care. Absolutely, simply care about people. And let every decision that you make show and prove how much you care about people. It's pretty, pretty profound, um, the impact that, that that could have on every single nation. If, if the people that were in leadership in our governments genuinely, from whatever place of influence in government they have, whether it's from, you know, a janitor in a government building to the highest seats of authority and everything in between if every single one of them just cared. So then we begin to have conversations like, why wouldn't someone care? You know, these are the deeper things we have to think about on each of the mountains, the heart behind it. And then how do we, Jesus, there's this, 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 profound concept of King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Jesus constantly included others in his leadership. 
He was constantly inviting people into leading and serving like him. The example of feeding the 5,000 is perfect because Jesus could have pulled that off by himself. He could have been the man. You know, he could have just literally, poof, snapped his fingers and had a gourmet feast right there for everyone. Then they really would have made wanted to make him king, right? But he brought his disciples into the process. He said, you go get baskets. Now, actually, he told them to bring baskets with them, if I remember correctly. And then he, he said, I think he had them bless it, and he, they began multiplying it. They got to be the heroes too, which meant they got to be the servants too. I mean, think about how much work that was. Thousands, 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 thousands of distributing, working, like I don't know how many hours Maybe all day it took to distribute all that food. They were serving like Jesus was serving. He invited them into this, this place of power and authority, which looks like serving and loving and caring. You're hungry? I'm going to feed you. But he empowered them to serve as well. And then... <laughs> He used the little boy in this example, which to me, this also speaks into government. He didn't just poof. He worked with what they had and he helped this boy who had been a, you know, had some forethought or his mom had forethought and he brought the food with him and he multiplied what they had. Government, socialism, that just communism, whatever, that just says, no, we're going to do all the work for you, but we just want you to all stay on the same level. There's no, there's no stewardship involved. There's no um, accountability of uh, a reward for those who do work harder, who do go the extra mile. That's when you get into the unjust, unfair. So the righteousness of this king is, it's, you know, anyway, like I said, I just want to kind of put that out there as something to think through. All right, switching gears real quick. Please register for our online event coming up in um, a week from tomorrow. So we need you to register right away. It helps us plan. Um, so one of the uh, teaser interviews was done yesterday. And if you haven't seen this, it's on YouTube and on Facebook. Um, Chris Keel, my son in love, um, he is uh, on there with Ryan Collins, and Ryan Collins is the CEO of, I think he's the CEO, of Bethel Tech. So Bethel School of Ministry, Bethel Ministries, Bill Johnson, all of that, they have this whole um, really fascinating track uh, of education called Bethel Tech, and Ryan is... A really amazing guy and so I think you'll really enjoy this interview um, so maybe take some time today and watch that um, and let me see what else yeah so register if you go to um, either an email that we've sent you or here on uh, Facebook you can scroll down and see um, our advertisements for it. I'm sure another one will go up today and hit that link. Actually, if you watch that interview, there'll be a link below it that you can use. Um, and anyway, let's see. Oh, the song. This is a brand new song that just came out like yesterday within 24 hours. Um, it's called You Have My Yes. You Have My Yes. It's such a good song. It's um, a tribal song, T-R-I-B-L by Naomi Rain and Marianne J. George. Naomi's voice is amazing. They both are. Um, you have my yes. So um, I'm going to pray over you real quick. God, we just, um, I thank you for this opportunity to speak your heart. Um, we just get little glimpses of it because as you know better than we know, we see in part. And we, even the part that we've seen of you as king, 
we are just mesmerized. You are true power, true authority, and love all wrapped into one. And we thank you for inviting us into your kingship and all that you did for us as king on the cross and what you endured so that you could be our king of kings and our lord of lords and we look to you we start with um just recognizing you as king of our hearts you are my king you are my king and how do i live and honor who you are as king and God, we just invite you into every aspect of our day and all that each one of us are facing right now, the different challenges and struggles. We just declare you as king over all of it. And we thank you that we can run to you and you speak life and wisdom and solutions over every one of these areas. So we just thank you. Thank you for inviting us into your throne room at all times and in those moments where we we need you we do we run into your throne room the seat of all power and all authority thank you for giving us access we love you we worship you in jesus name amen okie dokie well uh yes he knows exactly what he is doing i love it he is the best possibility of possibilities marina you've got some great things to say today that's so good kathy you said you watched chris yesterday oh and you liked the worship song yesterday right yeah it was so good all right love you guys see you tomorrow